This is day one of the June 97 seven day retreat in spring water. On this beautiful Sunday morning, cool and warming, with open doors and windows, in the midst of flowering meadows, can we talk about a new kind of listening? A new kind of listening and looking, not just with the eyes and ears, but being all eyes and ears. We, we have that expression when we really want to listen to something, we're interested. We're anxious to hear it or see it. We say, I'm all eyes, I'm all ears. Because that's often a very focused listening and attending. Something we want to hear or we're afraid of hearing. And this new kind of listening has no focus. It's just caw, caw and breathing, and distant airplane motor. Sensations throughout the body, not needing to be localized and known and named. The breathing happening as it does on its own. It is so simple, and why is it so difficult to just openly be here? That's what it means, all ears and eyes. Totally open to what's there, which is not what normally goes on for us. We're not totally closed, but we're usually very closed up. With what? What prevents us from this open, easy, light listening and looking? In touchness with what is actually here from moment to moment. Of course, in listening to a talk on a Sunday morning after retreat has started, one may not have slept well or much. Always difficult to sleep in a new place, in a strange bed, with roommates. So one may be tired. Does tiredness prevent the openness of listening? Sleepiness, exhaustion. That is one factor. The mind wants to turn in, turn off into dreams. It's not usually that when we sleep that the mind is completely turned off. It is spinning along the dream world. But there are other things, aren't there, that prevent our open listening to each other looking at each other, looking at ourselves and at the thousand things around us. We're enclosed in our own concerns and worries about ourselves, aren't we? It's not said judgmentally. This is a very important Factor in open listening, not to be condemning and not to project judgment into what is being said. 
not to project judgment at what I'm saying. I'm not judging what I'm pointing out. Well, looking at it, maybe become aware of it for the first time. Every time we become aware of judgment, it's for the first time. It's a new judgment. And it needn't happen, but it does happen. So to see it openly, to hear it, to hear what it does to the body, closing it up, holding it in its rigidities. This is right, that is wrong. And right according to my ways, to which I cling for dear life, don't we? We don't know it. We can't blame ourselves or blame others for it. It happens. It needs to come to light how we cling to thinking that our ways are right, which prevents openness of windows and doors, letting the air and sunshine and fragrance come in. Or better yet, to step out of the house altogether. Which is not an act of volition, it happens. That is the openness of listening. Out of the house. The shell of opinions and attitudes. Deeply ingrained habits of thinking and projecting and imaging. That's the house in which we live so confinedly, so separated from each other. Unhappy trying to create some in-house happiness. So in, in listening to a talk like this and the following talks, Can one notice what confines us? What confines us is wanting to hear certain things which agree with the way I'm oriented right now or occidented. I want to hear certain things to confirm what I feel myself. And I'm afraid of hearing what may question the house I'm living in? Can one sense, begin to sense those fears of upset? Tremendous fear of upset, of being upset in one's routinized ways. Wanting them confirmed dreading them being questioned. This may not all take place right now this morning as the wind rustles the leaves in sunshine and birdsong. And yet, do we feel inside a shell? And what is that shell? Somebody mentioned it to me this morning. I am very much me right now. So is there some curiosity to find out what is this very much me right now? As the birds are singing and the wind is rustling, fresh leaves, all glossy, not yet dusted over from a long summer. What is this very much me? Not to tackle it, to try to crack it, to try to overcome it or get rid of it. That's not what, what I'm here for. Maybe not what you're here for. What we're here for is to let air and sunshine permeate the crusts of the house so that they become lit up and clear and transparent for what they are, for what they do. Not what I do, but what habit and attachment and fear 
keep doing to this heart and mind and organism which I call myself. Are we interested to discover this very much me from moment to moment as it manifests? Shining the light on it, letting it, letting it become evident, revealing itself. Our insistence on our ways, our re resistance that's what very much me is resistance. That's what it is to a large extent. Resisting what? One feels, I don't want, I can't, I shouldn't. Not me. To, to allow resistance to reveal itself. Not to, to run the day. Not to overcome it, to reveal itself. What is it? Show yourself. What am I so afraid of? What am I so defensive about? As the crows are cawing. Do we realize how much we are captivated by ideas about ourselves, imagery, what we are, storyline, what was our life and how, sh how it should proceed, what should happen with my life, where I should be getting, what I should avoid. This is part of the wallpaper of this house is my story. We're not condemning it. They're marvelous stories, and we love to hear each other's stories, and it can be very illuminating to hear what somebody went through, what, what we all had to cope with in our childhood, in our youth, in the years of our unfolding life. Amazing stories to tell and to listen to. They're the wallpaper, the pictures on the wall of this house of little listening, little looking, little in touchness with the whole. The whole of life, which is not pictures. The brain makes pictures of living things like myself and you and the trees and the birds and all the humming insects. The brain is constantly, constantly creating pictures and stories. An amazing feat, which is very helpful for a lot of our survival up till now, it has been and has also been a real disservice because the, the picture story of my life, of the world in which I live, my ideas and imagery about this world in which I live, so, so, can be so vivid and so engaging of this body, mind, and heart. I'm not in touch with this simple moment of nowness, Drrr, beating of heart, entering and leaving of air, vibrations in the body. This instant of no separation through story or walls of meanness. That's the truth. The fact is that we live ensconced. In dramatization, somebody called it this morning, this constant dramatization of my life. It 
feels so much richer, the stories, the movies, the videos, the theater, the news. And it's, it's so engaging, so stimulating to the human organism that when that is absent, it seems as though we are practically in a void. Because we're so dulled, the senses are dulled by the constant stimulation of what the brain manufactures in imagery and theater. We're not condemning theater. It's a marvelous thing. And marvelous people have written theater to show us to ourselves, to hold up a mirror. So this is what, what really happens when one comes to a retreat, maybe full of expectation. Is one aware of being full of expectation or having been? At this moment, maybe there is some listening and birding and winding and breathing. But one comes full of expectation of what this quiet beauty will do for one. But what happens initially to most people, not to everybody, not all the time, but what usually happens initially is this voidness, the absence of, of the usual stimulation and the response of the organism, like withdrawal, cold turkey. It takes, it takes a while for the, for the body, mind and heart to become more sensitive again in the absence of so much artificiality. sensitive to all the beauties inside and out and all the pain that is, has been overlaid by extraneous stimulation. So are we, are we ready and willing to listen completely to what reveals itself in the absence of our daily artificiality? By that I mean involvement in so much thinking, so much projecting, so much remembering and anticipating. That's what I mean right now by artificiality. To, to let it all shine up, become transparent, without immediately wanting something in its place. Well, if not that, then what, what, what can you give me? What can you do for me? To take the place of all the structures that do not serve well, most of the time, spiritually, psychologically. There's nothing to give. Everything is here. If we will just listen, quiet down, and not expect the spectacular. Not expect that to happen which we've wanted all our lives. That is living in known projections. Projections of knowing something that should happen to me. What is this moment? devoid of expectation. And not that expectation may instantly drop away. It can. It can instantly drop away at the moment of awareness being engaged in another expectation. But usually when he hears it churning, someone can watch it. I want this. I wish that. I don't like this. This should change. Oh, for that and that that I have read about or dreamt about all my life. And the airplane is humming. Can we hear it?
the motor of the plane and the motor of expectation humming away. in the midst of some awareness, some open listening and looking. Anything that may come up in you and me through some thought, some memory, some association, maybe a fragrance awakens some memory. These things happen very fast and usually what we feel as the beginning of the whole episode is that the, there's fear in the body or wanting or anger. May not have captured, caught the quickness of functioning of memory to, to trigger it. What was remembered may already be lost and it doesn't matter. What matters is the, the readiness, the capacity which is there for all of us to be completely with what is coming up in this body, mind and heart. Painful or joyful? It's, it's easily said, and we've all read it many times in all the spiritual journals and books. But to do it, for it to happen, is a totally amazing thing. That's possible to be with the pain and pangs of fear and anxiety. Totally dismantled. from defenses, from resistance, just meeting what's there, which is not what we think is there, not what we fear is there or hope would be there. It's raw material of this moment rippling along, rippling along on an ocean of nothing, this emptiness of complete listening and looking which has no axe to grind, no position to defend. It's just there to meet what's there, to behold it, neither pushing it away nor grasping it. That capacity is there for human beings, ordinary like you and me, Lots of thoughts in the mind. Let them be. A, a fly or a bee buzzing in the window, let it be. Pain in the back or knees or hips, let it be. Don't know it. Don't know what it is. Here we don't. We have this luxury in this place for a week, not needing to know, except if you do your job, you have to know where the toilet brushes are, the cleaner, or where the carrots are, or the yogurt, dishwasher, how that functions, takes some knowledge. Other than that, we don't need to know anything about ourselves. All we need to do is discover what presents itself quite readily, every moment, unless we overlook it or push it away with fantasy, or holding on to some kind of a practice maybe, because I don't want to be bothered by emotions or pains. If 
in that condemning people who hold on to practices. We can talk about it, we can look at it. Is it just something that happens naturally, experiencing the breathing without knowing? Are we experiencing it without knowing, not what a breath is, what this body is, where everything is located? Experiencing breathing from moment to moment needs no knowing, no maps. It just happens miraculously. Deep breath and short breath, and at times hardly any breath. But not just from nose to diaphragm and back out through the lungs, but this entire body participates in what we call breathing, but know really not what it is. And it need not be concentrated upon, because it happens. Awareness happens, and breathing is awareness. Awareness is breathing. It needs not be focused on. It has lots of things permeating it, or it's permeating the, the bird calls and wind noises the coughs and movements. Awareness permeates it. Breathing permeates it all. We need not create little chambers of separation. This is my practice and that is distraction. Why do we do this to ourselves? Thought does it. Habit does it. Compulsion does it. But that's not what really happens. What really happens in breathing, in listening, in being here? So much that we don't know what it all is. said a little bit earlier to, to meet up with what we call this very much me, very much myself. And how it closes the doors of listening openly to discover it. And at a moment of discovery, wondering whether it has to continue that way. It may or may not. Sometimes, at a moment of discovery, there's such freedom of movement. One doesn't have to go with an old habit, if it is seen through, of defending or insisting or resisting. All it needs is to come upon and listen and look and let things unfold themselves in the presence of a non-judgmental awareness. Usually on the first day, I do talk about authority. Not making Tony into an authority who tells one what to do, what not to do. This is what we want, this is what we are habituated to. Making each other into authority that we either follow or that we fight with. I'm not saying things here to be followed or believed in or accepted. It's just a very natural impulse to present and look. I'm looking at the same time that I'm talking. Are you too looking at the same time that you're listening? It's not easy in the beginning. We're not used to it. We have sort of separated off our knowing listening from directly exploring and looking. But it'll happen if one is patient, patient with this work of this moment. 
So, what is said here is not to be believed in or followed or made into one's own opinion, but left there to look, to test out or explore alone or together. So there's no need to create authority in each other. If you say something that sounds very interesting, has a ring of truth, I'll look at it. If I can't see it right now, I'll keep it in the back of my mind. It does that. If something really sounds very challenging or provocative, one cannot forget it. One doesn't see it. One can't uh, understand it, and yet one can't let go of it. At times, of course, one will forget, but it will resurface again. And maybe resurface at a moment of really seeing, yes, this is so. Yes, this is really so. And now I understand. So often people tell me after years, I finally understand what you're talking about. In that there is no authority making. There's understanding, seeing eye to eye. Not as two eyes. So, having been very used to creating authority as well as fighting authority, can this process be discovered in ourselves and each other as we go? So much wanting, so much wanting security. Security to be with someone who can tell me, who knows it all, with whom I can be safe, which often means I don't need to look and think for myself. But this is not what is provided here. It's an opening of looking for oneself, albeit in the presence of someone who points out something. It can be very helpful, but it doesn't do the whole trick. Even though it is very tricky because a very clear, crisp intellectual understanding can masquerade for years as seeing the truth. And until the truth is directly seen or there is a direct opening, one doesn't realize that one is taking intellectual understanding for the truth. It makes so much sense. It's so logical. One can repeat it. One has it now in the system and can put it out oneself verbally. This is one step, it's a, it's a very helpful step that the intellect is clear and not confused or carrying false ideas, believing in false ideas, like this whole false idea of separation, separate individuals. We'll talk about this later as the retreat proceeds. So a clearing of the intellect is very helpful exercise, but it's not enough. It's, what is needed is to see directly what is intellectual function, to see it, not to think about it, to see it out of this openness and stillness, emptiness of no enclosures, Enclosures being our opinions, our attachments to myself. My, we've gone through it this morning, slightly. So if our relationship with each other is not of 
seeker for authority and dispenser of authority or of the of the truth of the dogma of the faith what is our relationship how do we relate to each other do we need to relate each other in any which terms with any which image or idea I say no it's not necessary not necessary for me to have any image ridden relationship with anyone here that's very freeing and, and freeing from barriers freeing of all this insulating stuff that hangs between us when we see each other in certain pictures and ideas and roles. Do you see that? At least intellectually, how freeing it would be if one didn't have to look at each other through role-playing and image-making. Acknowledging that this is what the, what the brain does all the time, prescribe imagery, Create it, prescribe the roles that go with this image, and so forth. But it needn't be followed, even though the brain is habituated to doing it. I'm talking right now about our relationship here in this retreat. So not to complicate it with when one applies for a new job for an, and has an interview. You may not get this position unless you play a role. I mean, it may come with a job certain behavior, bedside manners, and so forth. I'm not talking about this right now. That too can be elucidated with awareness. One may play the game, but not be emotionally involved in it, invested in it. Not take on that part, even though it is played because it's asked for and necessary under the certain conditions. I'm talking about here right now with a buzzing fly, what's the relationship? What's, what's our relationship with each other in talking, in meeting each other? You don't know? I don't know either. That's a good start. In the past, I've said, let let's it be the relationship of friends. We'll be friends. But some people don't feel friendly toward another, not at, at certain times. And then it's again an imposition. We are friends when one feels full of uh, antagonism toward somebody. I want to think that I'm, I'm this person's friend. One may feel that way. Then I've said, I, I won't take that back. A relationship of mutual respect, is that possible? Respecting each other for simply what we are this moment, not insisting to be accepted this way, but respecting each other. Respecting means to look again, have another look at the way we are right now. Not that it will last, particularly if we don't make much imagery of it, much memory, then we can move freely and drop the past scene. So, can we, can we meet each other respectfully, yours? Seeing each other freshly as for the first time, no matter what has all happened in the past, lots of things have happened for all of us, with each other and with others in the past. So much that if everything was remembered, we would be crushed by the burden. And it's totally unnecessary. Because this moment, as the birds are squawking, and the wind is gently moving through the trees and foliage, there is no tie up with the past. The past lives its own life of remembrance 
and traces in the brain and traces throughout the organism. But that whole life of the past, present and future can illuminate right now in fresh seeing. Illuminate means not running on as rusty tracks, but revealing itself. For its phantom-like nature. Am I talking too fast? Am I saying too much? So let the words go. What is everything, this instant of fresh listening? We will end here for today.